Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Let's share in prayer together. Our fathers, we bow before you today. We thank you for a beautiful day together in your name. We thank you for those that are gathered here in this place and in places all around the world to worship you. We pray that you would be with Brother Duke as he shares from your word. We ask your anointing of us, the Holy Spirit, and help us to have our hearts and minds listening intently, catching each thought that is presented here. And Lord, help us to listen with an intention to do what you say. Heavenly Father, if there's some here today who need to find you as their Savior and Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in their hearts. We know that he will. But we pray that they would respond in faith and confidence in you. We thank you for the one that's going to be uh, demonstrating her new life in you by being baptized today. We ask your great blessing upon her life. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. I am so looking forward to this message today. I, <clears throat> excuse me. As I uh, was able to give it last week to Oak Hill Church as I filled in her pastor Leroy. And I just want to thank all you uh, visitors today. I got a dear friend of mine over there that I see at work quite a bit, brother, my friend Mark and his uh, lovely girlfriend April, and they're with us today. And for all of you who might be here visiting, especially you folks that have come today and brought your kids, I really want you to listen to this message today and take in what I'm trying to say, because you are the ones who are really affected by with the way this country is going and where it's going to end up. Uh, as I looked out there, it says, remember to vote. I'm looking at it right now. we got a big election coming up on Tuesday. Those who are able to vote, I, I, I ask you to go out and vote for the candidate who you think is right. That's all I can ask you to do. But in saying that, I just want to, Andy, I want to flip up a picture that we did yesterday. This picture right here was taken yesterday. That was our Bible and Biscuits. My wife took that picture, and I thought it worthy to show today. Look how many men we had there. And a lot of those guys, what the neat part of it is, a lot of them don't even come to our church. They come from outside, and they come to join. And Brother Mark leads the service today. But I just want to show you that. That was a good turnout we had yesterday, and enjoyed the fellowship. Mark gave a great message, and really enjoyed the time together. But in saying all this, back to the other picture that I had up there. That picture right there says, in God we trust. And my thought is, do we really? Do we really? It's written all over our currency. But you know, I was sitting there today and this morning, and I was telling my wife before we came to church, I said, you know, I was sitting there this morning, and I was preparing this message for today, and I said, I was thinking about that in God we trust. I said, it's written all over our coins and everything else, and we see it all the time. And it kind of fits in right with what I'm going to speak about here in a second in Deuteronomy chapter 6. God said, put it on your doorpost, write it on the front that's in front of your head, talk about it when you go to sleep at night and everything. He said, remember this, we have it right on our currency. But they've been trying to take that away. My thing is, I went to a Cardinal ball game here a few weeks ago. They accept no coins, no dollar bills. If you look at your credit card or if you look at your debit card, I, don't, I almost guarantee you, and that's if it's a specialized one, it doesn't say in God we trust on it, and that's where we're going. We're going to a currency with no currency, taking God off the coins, taking God off everything. And that's what I want to point out to you today, because I, I love Kennedy's song, and we didn't have this planned, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. How are you building your house? 
How are you building your house? Is it built on God or is it built on the way you want it to be? Because as I look in this, in Psalm 33, and I, I've got this right here, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And God will bless that nation. But I've seen that ours has fallen so far back that, guys, that sometimes I wonder if we can ever recover from it. I don't know. I pray that. And we're going to get into more of that as we go along. But uh, just to give a little history, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 first. But just to give a little history, Abraham was told that uh, he was going to be the father of many nations. God kept his promise, and he was, through his son Isaac. We know that Isaac begot Jacob, and then through Jacob, who became Israel, through him came the 12, what we know, patriarchs. And I'm leading up to Joshua is what I'm doing, because guys, uh, in our Sunday school class here, in our Wednesday night class here recently, we just finished up the book of Joshua. And I was reading Joshua's farewell address, and I thought, wow, we're talking about 1300 B.C., 3300 years ago, from where we are today, and I was, as I was reading his farewell address, I thought, that's no different than what we are today. It's the same thing that it was in Joshua's day as where we were falling apart because we forgot our Lord, our God. And that's what we're going to look at today. And it's going to uh, just kind of go through. And first, I want to go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, as I said. And, and this is called what they call the, the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jews call this the Shema. And they, they recite it twice a day along with Deuteronomy. Uh, there's some verses in Deuteronomy and also in Numbers that they recite daily. Probably because of what God told them to. To remember this. It says, hear, O Israel. And that's what the word Shema means. It's just a Hebrew word for hear. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, Lord, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. See what I'm saying? He said, be hard at it. Be, be strong at it. Teach it diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you, you shall bind them on the sign on your hand and you shall be frontless between your eyes and you write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. What's he saying? Don't even leave the house without remembering the Lord your God. Write them on your heart. Write them on everything. But do not forget who you are. Today, as you go into your workplace, don't forget who you are when you get there. Don't forget that you are a represent. If you're here today and you're calling yourself a Christian, you have to walk as Christ walked. And hopefully others see that. And, yet, and they might want what you have. That's what, the, that's what he's telling us here. Moses, the writer in Deuteronomy here, by the inspiration of God, he has given us that to him and told him to remember that. He has passed that along now to Joshua. Moses didn't get to go into the promised land along with those other, uh, that other generation because of their disobedience. God says they will not see the promised land. So God let the children of these folks go in, led by Joshua. And God says, I will go before you and I will drive out the nations from before you and give you the land that's flowing with the milk and honey. He said, you will all be well with you if you do what I say. Joshua's plan was thwarted a little bit by a man called Achan as they just taken over Jericho. The walls had fallen and this man Achan had took some of the spoils and God says, do not take nothing. He took a wedge of gold, some silver and an ornamented robe and he took him and hid him in his tent. And they went in to face this little country called Ai. And they said, oh, we don't need to send everybody into Ai. Just send a couple thousand. We can overtake them. You know what? They got their rear ends kicked. They got kicked. They got kicked back because they didn't, someone took, didn't take what God said. They didn't do what he said, said to do. He says, do not take nothing. And I want, what I want you to see in that is it was one man out of that whole nation. One person made the difference. And you know what? Joshua would have run around and they found out who did it. Achan confessed it. You know what God said? God didn't say, hey, Achan, that's okay. Just don't do it again. We're not going to lie. You know what God did? He killed his whole family. Killed his whole family. He took them all. You know what he was doing? He was ridden it of the sin. That, that, that generation, that group of people is not going to uh, infest this group that I call my children. And he got rid of them. You might think, well, that's kind of cold hearted. He's God, or not. But in Joshua, in this here, they had conquered these lands as God has promised them. They've come in, they've conquered the land, and they've overtaken the land. 
God drove them out, but they didn't drive everybody out. But he allotted them this group of these groups, and these groups moved into their places, but they still had to drive out the other residents. But Joshua was getting ready to die here. And Joshua in this, and it's kind of lengthy, but I'm gonna just just read this. Joshua chapter 23, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start in uh, the second verse. Joshua said, I am old and advanced in age. He was 110. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is He who fought for you. See, I have divided for you these nations that remain to be an inheritance to you, your tribes from the Jordan to the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess the land as the Lord your God has promised you. But this is the key. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Seems simple, don't it? God says, it'll be well with you. And God says, you don't even have to fight them. Look what he says here. Lest you turn aside to the right hand or to the left, lest you go among the nations and those who remain among you. You shall not make mention of the name of the gods, nor any of swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Look what this says here. For the Lord has driven out from before you great strong nations, but as for you, no one will be able to stand against you this day. One man shall chase a thousand, for the Lord God is he who fights for you, as he has promised you. Notice what he's saying there. He says one man can go up amongst a thousand. You don't have to worry about it. Guys, when we fall into things like that, when you get a bad report from the doctor, the Lord God says, if you're here today and you're a Christian, you say, God, I can't deal with this, but I know you can. That's standing up against a thousand. Whether good report, bad report, whatever it is, God says, I'm going to be with you, just as he's done with this nation of Israel. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God, or else if indeed you go back to the cling to the remnant of the nations, these that remain among you and make marriages with them, <clears throat> me and go into them, you, uh, them in the day to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps for you, scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. God has said, it's easy. You do what I say, I'll drive them out. You don't do what I say and let the other people come in, there are going to be thorns in your flesh and scourges in your eyes. Do we kind of see what that going on in our nation today with an open border? All the people who are coming into this nation, who legally they can be more than welcome to come into the nation, but we don't. We've opened the border to a bunch of criminals and everything else we're going. I just, I just wanted to throw that in because I see that going on in our nation today. So God makes a covenant with them. With Joshua speaking here with these people. So he's going to make this covenant with them. You guys know these verses probably very well. He's sitting there saying, okay, look what he says though. Let me, let me finish up this. He said this, uh, let me back up here. So he goes, and this is in chapter 24. He's making this covenant with them in Shechem. And he says, this is a verse you guys all know very well, 24, 14, or you should. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him. This is, they're making a covenant in sincerity and truth and put away the gods, which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. That's in my Bible, it was been put in there, but it's in parentheses, or not parentheses, but exclamation point. And for it, for if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served on the other side of the river, or for the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you dwell. This is the part. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Ain't that it? I pray that each and every one of you here have made that commitment today and saying, I'm going to serve the Lord. That's what I want to do because God says you can have it your way. You can go serve the other countries, do whatever you want, but I'm not going to be with you. I used to serve, live this life and serving in myself, and I know what it is to live without the Lord. I don't want that no more. I don't want to live without the Lord. Listen to what the people said. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did the great signs in our sight and preserved in all the way it went among us, all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites, who dwell in this land. And I got this highlighted in my Bible. 
We also will serve the Lord. He is our God. So the people said, as a whole, Joshua just didn't call the elders and everybody else in. He said, I want all the nation to come and hear this, and I want you all to make this commitment. And they all said, everything you said, we will do. Everything you said, Joshua, we're going to do it. We know you're dying, but we'll carry on the torch. One generation later, in the book of Judges, Joshua is dying. He leaves it. We do see that Judah and part of the house of Joseph went in and drove out those other, drove out some of the people. But look what it says here. However, this is in Judges, uh, the, the first chapter in 27 verse. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. Goes on down to say, nor did Ephraim, nor did Zebulun, nor did Asher, nor did Nephetilic. The Ammonites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. What happened? They didn't do what God told them to do. God said, go in and drive all those people out. If you don't, they're going to be a snare to you. They didn't do what the Lord their God said. Verse 7 says in chapter 2, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua's life, and all the days of the elders who, went out, who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance at Timnath in Harris, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all, look at this, when all th that generation had been gathered to their, for their fathers, talking about the one through, through uh, Joshua, to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done in Israel. What, for, what happened? They forgot to tell the next generation, you would not believe what God did to us and how we got to where we are today. Folks, that's why I'm trying to tell you today that you got, to, especially I hear these little kids out here, you have the opportunity to tell those kids by getting them here to church and explaining to them, don't forget the Lord your God when you go to school. Don't forget it. That's what happened to these folks. That next generation said, oh, God's just doing it. We don't have to do nothing. He's going to take care of us. And he will, but you got to do what he says. Amen. He's not going to just sit there. Guys, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these guys, when you read the, the, the history of these guys, what happened? It wasn't Peachy King. And I hate when these preachers preach now. They're watching on TV all the time. Oh, if you just come to the Lord, everything's going to be good with you. You, your life's going to be perfect. He's going to give you uh, bank accounts that you can't even handle. Some of us got that anyway. I can't handle mine. <laughs> but, but I say that because, but what he's saying, he said he's going to give you all kinds of things like that. That's not what he said. Abraham's got his wife taken away from him twice. His son Lot went into a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. All these things, it come with a cost. Come with a price. He was even asked to offer his own son on the altar to God. But God spared him. It doesn't come easy. It comes with a price. You know, in saying that, in this, in Judges chapter 21, at the, end, the very last verse in 21, 25, it says, in that day, they didn't have no king. I thought I might have put it up there. They didn't have no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't have no king. They had the God of the Creator, the, cre the one who created the heavens and the earth. They had a king. They had the, the sovereign Lord who was over everything. They had the, one, the, the only one they did need, the one who drove out everybody. But you know what? It's no different today. There's more things important than serving the Lord our God. So what happened? Look at America today. I think about the words of Jesus, real simple. John chapter 14, the 15th verse. Jesus asked one thing of us. If you love me, keep my commandments. Boy, that's pretty simple, ain't it? Why is it so hard for us to do? Jesus said, or I should say, Jesus, this is, of course, this is through the, the, in 1 John, through the prophet, or the apostle, he says, Do not love the world of the, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 
Guys, we are. We are to be salt. In, in the scripture, this is, Jesus says we are the salt of the world. And we are the light. Salt is a preservative. We know most of you all in here, if you've done it in canon, you know that. Salt, one thing salt does though, salt doesn't prevent the decay. Let me put it this way. It doesn't stop the decay. It prolongs it long enough. But the decay still comes. Like when they used to put that on that meat, it would preserve it for a little while. But eventually the decay come and it would pass away. We are to be that salt in this country, in this nation, right now, just for the time. Because it is passing away. But you know what? I, was tell, I was told this to the church last week. This ministry I listened to is a lady called Jan Markell. It's Hollow Tree Ministry. She always says at the end of her program, sometimes she says it, sometimes she don't. But one thing she says is, when it seems like this world is falling apart, it's just falling into place. It's exactly as God has seen it going. God knew. God knew we were going to be a disobedient people, just as He knew Israel was. It only took one generation from, from the time of Joshua to that next generation, 40 years, somewhat, that they forgot the Lord their God. So my thought was, and I wanted to mention this, on Wednesday night Bible study a couple weeks ago, I showed a message that was by Dr. Robert Jeffers, First Baptist Church, Dallas. Dr. Jeffers in his message, man, he had so many good things in there. And I thought, man, I'm going to use that. So these are things I got from his message. I want to give him all the credit for the research. These are just things I copied from his, his message, his research that he had done. But they were copies that they're available to each and every one of us. My wife last night, as she was doing my PowerPoint for me, she was looking up some of these court cases. Because my question was, how did we get to where we're at today? What happened? John Adams, second president of the United States, says, Our Constitution was made for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That was John Adams, the second president of the United States, said, now, he didn't say for a Christian, for a religious and moral people. Remember that. But the Supreme Court Justice John Jay in 1789 to 1795, <clears throat> look, look, look at this quote from him. Providence, speaking of God, Providence has given our people the choice of their rulers and is a duty as well as a privilege and an interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Wow. Could you imagine what would happen to that guy today if he went up there and said, hey, I want all Christians, all of our rulers in this country to be Christians. You know what would happen to him? Oh, my goodness. They would run him out of, out of this country as fast if they didn't do away with him. It's probably what they would do. But he said to select Christian rulers. People he knew that could run this country in a way that had, just as John Adams says, a religion and a moral people. That's what he's looking at here. He's a religious and a moral people. And we think about that, and of course I just took bits and pieces of what, what, uh, that message. What about the wall of separation, Duke? There's a wall of separation, isn't there? And I'd put it up there. The purpose of the founders was to keep one Christian dom denomination from being evaluated above another. Our founders never meant for Christianity to be subservient to other religions in the world. That letter by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists in 1802, he sent this letter to them, personal letter to them, stating that one denomination would not be over another. Words. Not trying to keep the church out of the government, but to keep the government out of the church. Amen. And for Dr. Jeffers says he was confronted by a man, a reporter who said, what do you think about the wall of separation? Dr. Jeffers says, there is no wall of separation. He said, well, it's in the Constitution. Guys, I'm here to tell you today, there's nowhere in the Constitution does it say there's a wall of separation. Nowhere. It was something they put in. And you're going to see that. This wall of separation, this Supreme Court case in 1980, or 1844, excuse me, in Pennsylvania was Vidal versus Gerard's executors. What happened here was this rich man had died and he had told the people, he says, I left all this money behind, leaving all this money behind, but there could be no Christian minister 
teach in that school. All right? You know what? The Supreme Court upheld that. They upheld it. But, look what they said. Supreme Court says, Why may not the Bible, especially the New Testament, without note or comment be read and taught as a divine revelation in the college? Its general precepts expounded and its evidence explained, and its glorious principles and morality inculcated. That means to be instilled, implanted, or ingrained into the people. That's the Supreme Court. Why not be put in there? Yeah, they weren't going to have a Christian preacher do it, but why shouldn't it be taught? Remember that as we go along here. New Jersey. 1947. This man was uh, this board, Everson versus the Board of Education. They wanted uh, what they were trying to do here was stop the tax money, the funding of, of running buses in New Jersey, and they were kind of trying to stop it. But this man, Hugo Black, a Supreme Court justice, reminds you, he was a Supreme Court justice. Hugo Black, come to find out, Hugo Black was a former KKK member. All right. Most of this tax money was going to Catholic churches. And the other thing that the Catholic churches or that the that Ku Klux Klan members didn't like besides black folks was Catholics. And he says, they ain't getting none of that money, is what he said. So this is what he said. This is what he said. You know what? Those Supreme Court upheld that decision where they did continue to get the tax money. But look what he said. This is the first time in 150 years that wall of separation was ever even mentioned in a court case. He says, the First Amendment has erected a wall between the church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. He wasn't happy with the separation, so he mentioned the separation of church and state. 150 years since the time of Thomas Jefferson mentioning that personal letter to the Danbury Baptist 150 years later is the first time no other court case has ever mentioned anything about a wall of separation until this right here. And it was mentioned. Okay? There your first stone was laid in this wall of separation. Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice right now, said this doctrine was born in bigotry, the wall of separation, church and state and should be buried. That was a direct quote from our Supreme Court Justice now. New York, 1962. This is the decline, guys, is what I'm trying to show you here. 1947. Now we're in 1962. Engel versus Vitale. This was prohibiting uh, voluntary school prayer. That the Almighty... This, is the, this, was, this is what they were saying. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg that the blessings upon us our parents, our teachers, and our country. He said, you can't do that. You can't do that. We do not want our kids knowing about this 22-word prayer. And they stopped it. They got their way. They didn't mention the word prayer. But my thought is, why wouldn't you want your kids... Our blessing upon our parents, our teachers, and our country. Why wouldn't you want your kids to go to a school that says, God, I want to pray for my parents today. I want to pray for my country and for my teachers. we got a lot of educators in this room right here right now. Why wouldn't we want those kids saying that each and every day? But somebody got offended by it and says, we can't do that. You know what we did as Christians? Okay. Okay. 1963, Abington School District versus Shemp. Voluntary Bible reading. They read 10 verses of the Bible. The Supreme Court says, and this, this was a, a court case, uh, this uh, Abington School District versus Shemp. Supreme Court says that if the scriptures were read to the students without an explanation, it could be psychologically harmful to the students. Amazing, Brother Mark. It's amazing to me <laughs> that they would think that you could take the Word of God which says do not steal, do not commit adultery, and all these other things, and say it would be harmful to our kids. But bringing a gun into the school is okay. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. 1967. 
This one really, this one really got me. 1967, Despain versus DeKalb County Community School District, prohibiting a kindergarten teacher from stating voluntarily the kids could state everything. We thank you for the flowers so sweet. We thank you for the food we eat. We thank you for the birds that sing. We thank you for everything. You know what I noticed about that prayer? Do you see God's name mentioned anywhere? You know what they said about that prayer? That the kids might read that and desire to know God and who He is and what He has in store for them. That's my way of putting in basically what they said. That, a simple little prayer. Doesn't even mention God, but they could start thinking about God and do what He said. This is where we come to, guys. This is the country that we live in. But the appeals court said, you can't say that. Even though it didn't mention God, it could cause them to think about Him. You know what they also did in that court case? This, this was an appeals court uh, upheld by the Supreme Court. They quoted Hugo Black's assertion in Everson, the wall of separation. The First Amendment has erected a wall between the churches and the state, and the wall must, not be, must be high enough and not to be impregnate, or, uh, <laughs> impregnable. The, but think, think about that. What he's saying there. They, mentioned, they just mentioned Hugo Black. Said, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. Back here, this guy over here said, there's a wall of separation. We can't allow that in our schools. This is a federally funded place. My tax dollars ain't going there. We didn't do nothing about it. We let it go. 1980. It's the year I graduated. Kentucky. Stone versus Graham. Posting of the Ten Commandments. Private donors posting copies of the Ten Commandments in the hallways of the schools. Notice that. Private donors. No school money. No nothing. They just come in and wanted to post the Ten Commandments into the schools. Look at what the Supreme Court ruling says. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have an effect at all, it would be to induce the children to read, meditate upon, perhaps venerate. That word venerate means to be reverence of or respect and obey the commandments. However desirable this might be as a matter of private devotion, it is not permissible state objective under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Where did they get that? It's not even in the First Amendment. But you know what? Nobody did nothing about it, and now we can't have it. But you know what? Louisiana stepped up here the other day, and I heard that they're posting the Ten Commandments in their schools. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Somebody's taking a stand, and you're seeing where I'm going at with this. You have to take a stand. But you know, also I heard the governor of Oklahoma said he was going to start Bible reading in the school. And if you didn't like it, move to California. Yeah. Amen to that. I seen that on the news the other day. He said, move to California where they don't do that. But they're going to start Bible reading. Praise the Lord. Guys, I'm starting to see it. Give me cold chills because I'm starting to see a little bit of Revival, I guess we'll call it. And that's what it's going to take. It's not going to happen overnight. Just as they've creeped in, we've also got to start creeping in. But we've got to make a stand. We've got to make a stand. We see the steady decline that we've had in this nation. What has happened? We've forgotten the Lord our God. That's what we've forgotten. They did a study on this. From 1960, whenever they started these court cases in 1960, to 1997. And I just want to show you, look at there. This is what happens when you take God out of everything. 460% increase in the illegitimate births. 200 increase in teenage suicide. One in four women will abort a child by the age of 45. One million babies are aborted each year. 10 million, 10 million teenagers drink alcohol. And that list right there goes on and on and on and on. Because why? We've not done nothing about it. We've continued to sit back and let the evil creep in. And we just take it. We just creep in. We've forgotten the Lord our God. Hosea. Chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Whew. Guys, that's, that's a powerful statement. God says, you want to forget me? I'm going to forget you, and I'm going to forget your children. 
my thought about this is, and Lord, this all came to me this morning too. Every one of them court cases, did you see where they're happening at? In the school. In the school. They're attacking our children. You, as parents, and me, as a parent, we got to start stepping up, whether it's attending a school board meeting that says we're not going to let the woke people come in and, and display all this homosexuality, this transgender stuff, and all this crud that's going on within our school. We're not going to put up with it anymore. We're tired of it. We're going to kick it out of our school. We're going to start seeing a little bit of this, the, the Bible reading coming back in, maybe the posting of the Ten Commandments, but also that we just don't bow down and let them do what they want to do because that's what we've done. We've got to kick them out. We've got to start turning back to what the Lord our God has said. I put up there the next verse, the Second Chronicles. You guys have known that. My question was, God, what do we do about this? What do we do about it? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will from heaven, hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Amen. One thing you can do is you can pray. We should all be praying. I pray every day. I try to remember to pray for this country every night. But we got to start praying, folks. We got to start getting on our knees and seeking the Lord God because I'm going to tell you right now. We're letting the enemy win. He's winning. And until the Christian people, those who are called by His name, we start doing something about it, we're going to lose. Just as the Supreme Court Justice, he said, you know, that uh, we have that right as a Christian community to elect our officials. I'm not making this a political statement. I'm just trying to tell you how the, one thing we can do as Christians. We just don't sit back and say, I don't like either one of those candidates. I'm not voting for either one of them. You just voted for the worst one. You have a voice is what I'm trying to tell you. We got an election coming up on Tuesday. Of course, a big one in November. I'm asking you as Christian brothers and sisters, think about it. Study your candidates. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we know the answer is not in the White House. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. As I said about being salt in the earth, this is just a little bit what we can do to stop the decay. But what we can do is have a voice. But when we just shut our mouths up and just sit there and say, well, I won't want to get involved in that. I see that with that, uh, the, gay, the, the transgender stuff and all this stuff. Oh my goodness. Why do I have to boycott going into Target because I'm not going in there because the women's restrooms are open? Because I'm here to tell you right now, if I take my granddaughter there and she goes into the bathroom and some transgender guy wants to go in there, I'm going to stop him and say, you can't go in there. Amen. And it's going to be a testing of my faith on how I do it. I will handle it like a Christian, but he's not going to, I guarantee you, because that's how we, and I'm not going to bow down and let him walk in there. We've got to make a stand. We've got to make a stand. We've got to make that stand. We've got to start putting Christ first. We got to start putting him first because if we forget the Lord our God, he's going to forget us. And I see that happening in this country. I think that's where we're at today. I think 9 11 was a, a little precursor to where we're at today just because of who attacked us. So, my thought is today, Christians, brothers, and sisters, pray about this nation. Do your part. Let's don't be silent, let's have a voice. Let's have a voice in who we are. And, and again, in, in Peter, he tells us, you know, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. But he says, do it in meekness and love. Don't go out there wanting to bash people's heads and things like that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. What you can do is come to people in love and say, I'm not voting for that person because they believe in killing babies. I'm not voting for that person. I'm telling you right now, I'm not. Ain't going to do it. And always remember, you're not voting for a pastor. We're voting for a leader of this country. Amen. And that's what we got to do. All right. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer, Lord God, we just thank you. We thank you that just that you loved us enough that you come and give yourself as a sacrifice for sins on our cross. But God, we failed you. We failed in this country. It was the greatest nation of the earth, on this earth. Lord, as you had so blessed it, given us all the freedoms that we have to enjoy our liberties that we have. But God, we've forsaken you. 
We're coming to you today as a church, lifting our voice, Lord, today to you. And I pray that we continue to do it, not forsaking the Lord our God as we've done th over 3,300 years ago, Lord, forgetting what you have done for us. Pray for this nation. We pray, God, to you, knowing that you are the answer, not in the White House, not in the schoolhouses, anywhere else. It's coming straight from the, the God of heaven. We're asking you to have revival in this country and this nation around us, continuing to watch over Israel as we've been called as a nation to protect your people, Israel. Pray for their protection, Lord. But we thank you. As we come here today, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we lift him up to you, giving you all the praise and glory. It's in his precious name, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.